Well, thank you so much, everyone who's here for joining us for this launch event for Bright Green Lives, a new book by Derek Jensen, Lear Keith, and Max Wilbert, who are graciously have joined us here. Um, Bright Green Lies, if you aren't familiar with it, it dismantles the illusion of quote unquote green technology in breathtaking comprehensive detail. And it reveals it as a fantasy that must perish if there's to be any hope of preserving life on this earth. The book is released by Monkfish Book Publishing, a wonderful publisher, and is available now from online and local retailers. We'll talk more at the end here to make sure everyone knows where they can pick it up and where they can order it. Um, for me, myself, my name is Jonah. I'm a member of an organization that Derek and Lear helped found, and uh, Max, Derek, and Lear are all personal heroes of mine, so I was very honored to uh, be asked to help run the stream and ask them some questions and help them introduce the book. Uh, I know we're all on Zoom too much anyway lately, but it means a lot to me and it means a lot, I'm sure, to everyone, for everyone to have come here and watch this event and get a, a taste of this new book coming out because, and I'm not just saying this, I really do think it's a very important book and I'm so excited for it to kind of get out there and for people to engage with it. So um, for those who aren't familiar, the book uh, Bright Green Lies is written by Derek Jensen, Lear Keith and Max Wilbert. Um, I'm just gonna talk a little bit about who they all are and give them introductions, introduce them well, and then we'll start kind of a, a, a discussion around the topic and themes of the book. But Derek Jensen, is the acclaimed author of more than 25 books, including A Language Older Than Words, The Culture of Make-Believe, and Endgame. He weaves history, philosophy, environmentalism, economics, literature, and psychology in his work to make a passionate call for concrete environmental solutions that focus on our most primal human desire, to live on a healthy earth overflowing with uncut forests, clean rivers, and thriving oceans that are not under the constant threat of being destroyed. He's joined by Lear Keith, a writer, small farmer, and radical feminist activist, who is the author of six books, including The Vegetarian Myth, Food, Justice, and Sustainability, which has been called the most important ecological book of this generation. She is also co-author with Derek and Eric McVeigh of Deep Green Resistance, A Strategy to Save the Planet. She's been arrested six times for acts of political resistance, and she now lives in Northern California, where she shares 20 acres with giant trees and giant dogs. And having been there, I can say the trees are big, but the dogs are somehow even bigger. Uh, so now we have finally Max Wilbert, a, a dear friend of mine, an organizer and wilderness guide in Eugene, Oregon, who's the chief editor of the Deep Green Resistance News Service and the producer of the Green Flame podcast. He's the author of We Choose to Speak, and his, worth has, uh, his work has been published in Earth Island Journal, Counterpunch, and Dissident Voice. A third generation dissident, he came of age in a family of anti-war and anti-racist activists in the post-WTO Seattle. His grassroots social, racial, and environmental justice activism in solidarity with indigenous communities in Canada and the US spans nearly 20 years. He's currently active in the, prote in the Protect Thacker Pass occupation against lithium mining, industrial scale water extraction, and deforestation in Nevada. So, I wanted to open this up and start by asking you, Derek, the title of this book, Bright Green Lies. For those who might not be familiar, what does bright green refer to? And what are the lies that you're really challenging in the book? Of course, we'll get deeper into this, but just generally, what should someone think when they see that title? Well, bright green is a phrase that is that means that they believe that this culture can be made to be sustainable with some uh, technological fixes. And one of the ways that we see this would be, they believe that, um, that wind and solar will save the planet from global warming. Wind and solar can run the economy and not harm the planet. And, um, the, the lies are, well, that. And the, the, the fundamental lie is that uh, we can have this culture, this level of consumption and a planet too, that you can eat the planet and still have a livable planet. And more specifically, the lies would be that wind and solar and geothermal, et cetera, don't harm the planet 
and that they also, that they can run an industrial economy and neither of which is true. So even on their own terms, they're, they're not being accurate. And the fundamental problem with all of this is, as we say in the book, they're solving for the wrong variable that, you know, what do all the so-called solutions to global warming that you hear about in the mainstream media have in common? What they all have in common is they take industrial capitalism as a given and the natural world is having to, to adapt to industrial capitalism, to conform to industrial capitalism. And I remember a line I read in, the, in some paper or another many, many years ago, where they said that the, uh, the rule of nature is adapt or die. And they were talking about some species being driven extinct by this culture. And that's saying that everybody has to adapt to this way of living or die. But that's literally insane in terms of being out of touch with physical reality because without, because the land base has to be primary. The health of the planet has to be primary because without a planet, you don't have any social system whatsoever. Every social system that has ever existed is based on the health of the land. And if you have a way of life that is based on destroying the health of the land, that is to use Lier's common praise, um, not a plan with a future. And so the fundamental lie is that, is that we can continue this way of living with just a change in, in what fuels the destructive activities. And I mean, I don't think it really matters whether, it doesn't matter to the, to the fish being caught in the drift nets, whether the ships are powered by bunker fuel or solar, apart from the fact that solar wouldn't really do it anyway for reasons we can get into. Um, and I wanna say one more thing before, before I pass, pass this on, which is I am very excited to be here, but that sound you're hearing is, is not me, it's, it's the dog. I'm, I'm excited, but I'm not so excited that I'm panting. Um, anyway, so uh, those are the fundamental lies. And then in the book, we go through the various lies. Like they argue, I mean, just to take a couple examples, they argue that hydropower is carbon neutral. And so Costa Rica is, for example, called this tremendous success story because they get, I don't know, 99% of their electricity uh, from solar. I mean, I'm sorry, from, from hydro. And A, dams are incredibly expen uh, environmentally destructive. And the only good thing you can say about them ecologically is at some point they fail. And the other thing is that it ends up that they are worse than even coal for global warming because... Uh, they're called methane bombs by some people because when you fill up the reservoir, uh, there are lots. There's lots of organic matter at the bottom of what used to be living biomes, and it decomposes anaerobically, turns into methane, and then is released. So they're actually worse than burning coal, even. But it's for accounting purposes, it is counted as zero. Or another great one, just last night. A uh, friend sent me a, an article about how great Europe is doing on meeting some of its carbon emission goals. And I, I responded, part of the reason is because they've outsourced uh, a lot of their heavy industry to Southeast Asia. And it's the same in the United States, that the one reason the United States is not much worse in terms of carbon accounting is because it imports so much stuff from China, Singapore, Indonesia, Malaysia, Korea, and those countries get dinged for the carbon emissions. So there's a lot of accounting shenanigans we can talk about, but the main one, I guess I'll say one more lie and I'm jumping around here, but I'll say one more lie, uh, which is, I mean, first, of course, solar photovoltaics, wind, they're tremendously environmentally destructive as we talk about in the book, but also they won't work for even doing what the bright greens want them to do an example of that is look around right now and ask yourself, everything you see around you, how many trucks was it on? How many semis? And semis are a great example of why oil is functionally irreplaceable for an industrial economy because uh, diesel fuel has basically an energy, can, can hold about 46 megajoules per kilogram. That's a lot of energy. And 
lead acid batteries are like one megajoule, or half point, a megajoule, point 0.17. One. Point 0.17 megajoules per kilogram. Lithium ion is not much better, maybe one. And so the point is that if you have a diesel semi, you can go, you can have 60,000 pounds of payload and go 600 miles on a tank. To have that same range, you would have to have 55,000 pounds of batteries, which means you only have a 5,000 pound payload, which what's, what's the point? And the point here is that this math should have been done by all the bright greens, all the climate activists. This should be done. I understand if a neurosurgeon or a cricket player or a, you know, your next door neighbor doesn't understand these, but people who talk about climate issues, they should not say that dams are carbon neutral. They shouldn't say that biomass is carbon neutral. They shouldn't, they shouldn't say any of those things. They should know better. And after this book, one hopes they will. Great, Derek, thank you so much. And I kind of have a, uh, not a related question, but a similar question for Lear, which is after everything's Derek has said there, there are still people who, you know, even if they read, uh, you know, hear these facts or, or, or whatever, they still, they ask, well, wh why are you making such a big deal out of this, right? A lot of people will say, well, you know, even if it doesn't all add up, right? Aren't there bigger issues? Shouldn't you write about something else? So my question for you, Lier, but really for all of you is, why did you feel like it was important to write this book now, as opposed to any of the other many things you could be writing about? What do you think is so important about this issue that it needs this book? I'm gonna quote Rich Carson. If I stayed silent, there would be no peace for me. And I'm also gonna quote Bugorax. I speak for the trees but the trees have no tongues. We once had a movement that was dead set on protecting wild beings and wild places. And that movement is almost gone. Instead, we now have a movement that claims to call itself environmentalism, but its main goal seems to be how to continue to consume those wild beings and wild places. We just need to fuel it differently. And I don't recognize this movement. Um, the wild beings in the wild places need us more than ever. So that was why we wrote this book. And moving on to Max, I was wondering, I thought you would be one to answer this question, which would be, you know, Derek has just laid out all of these obvious contradictions, and I'm sure we'll get into more of them. And Lear has really demonstrated this passion for the living world that should define all of environmentalism. So the question becomes, why do you think there are so many people who call themselves environmentalists who are pushing these bright green lies? And maybe even more importantly, why are there so many people who call themselves environmentalists who really believe them? What do you think has gone wrong here? And how can we kind of shift it to a, a, a better direction? I think the core reason for this is that we have this mythology in our culture of progress. And that mythology informs so much of our culture going back hundreds, probably thousands of years. Uh, you know, I mean, I think you can draw a direct line from the people who thought the westward expansion of European colonization was manifest destiny. And the idea that, that green technology is going to save the planet, that it represents a progression forward. Uh, you know, but all, all of these ideas rely on the underlying assumption that we need uh, that we need progress, and that that usually looks like the progress of business, the progress of industry, the advancement of of technology, or what some people call technological escalation. So, uh, you know, the second reason I think that these lies have become so popular is because we've been seduced by you know, what Lewis Mumford called uh, the magnificent bribe. You know, people, even people who are living at the poverty line in a modern industrial society have levels of energy and material goods available to them at the snap of their fingers that are literally unthinkable a few generations ago, unimaginable. You know, the idea that you can click a button and have people deliver food to you, that you can have almost any product you want delivered to your doorstep in one or two days, uh, that you can, uh, you know, access the accumulated knowledge of the world in your pocket. These things are, are obviously extremely unusual in the history of our species. 
And we live in a society that's addicted to energy. You know, people are so used to uh, unlimited food, you know, uh, modern uh, luxury housing, swift transportation, instantaneous communication, uh, you know, endless amounts of entertainment. Uh, Mumford calls this the magnificent bribe that threatens to wipe out every other vestige of democracy. And what he means by that essentially is that, you know, this is not only undermining our sort of moral character and fiber as individuals, it's not normal or healthy for human beings to be sort of spoiled in the way that people in modern culture are, but also the process by which those things are provided to us is undermining the existence of life itself on this planet. Uh, you know, 90% of the large fish in the oceans are gone. Uh, this culture is changing the entire climate of the planet. Songbird populations are collapsing. 98% uh, of the old growth forests are gone. 99% of the prairies are gone. Uh, plankton populations who provide two thirds of the oxygen we breathe have collapsed by 40% since 1950. Uh, you know, I think another reason why these lies are so prevalent is because it's really easy. People want an easy answer to their problem. And you can't open up a newspaper these days without seeing the headlines about global warming, about all those issues that I just mentioned. Uh, you know, Lauren Hill, a musician, once said, fantasy is what people want, but reality is what they need. Uh, the problems that we're facing, you know, they are complex, they're multifaceted, they've developed over centuries and thousands of years. Uh, they're not going to be solved by just waving the magic wand of technology and everything's okay. Um, but people don't really want to hear that. Um, like Lauren Hill said, fantasy is what people want, but reality is what they need. And I think the third reason why these lies are so successful is marketing and the corporate capture of the environmental movement. Uh, you know, if you are willing to say that solar panels will save the world, you can get funded as an environmental movement. You can get grants, you can get foundation money, you can get a $50,000 check, you can get a $200,000 check, you can get a lot more than that. Uh, you know, in an early draft of Bright Green Lies, we write a great deal about uh, the influence of these mo the money on these movements. And a lot of this had to be cut, actually, just for reasons of, of length. But we're going to be releasing some of that material as, as articles and as standalone pieces. Uh, you know, and part of, the, part of what we wrote about in the segment was the sort of collusion and the increasing uh, relationships between these large mainstream environmental organizations and the, the business world, the business community. I mean, if you look at an organization like the Nature Conservancy, they have a list of corporate partners that you know, includes major banks, it includes you know, major agricultural companies like Cargill and Monsanto and, and uh, Archer Daniels Midland. Uh, it includes companies like Caterpillar that literally make the bulldozers that are used to destroy the planet. Uh, they're working with these companies and they're getting a lot of money from them in order for in exchange for uh, helping these companies look more sustainable and you know th there's a revolving door situation going on here just like there is in the military industrial complex where politicians get out of office and they go right to work in these uh in these defense contractors that they uh, provided uh, major government contracts to while they were in office and vice versa um, you see the same thing between these, uh, you know, large environmental groups and the so-called green businesses, um, which really is a is an oxymoron and is 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 such a widely misused term these days. It it should be completely ignored. But you know, uh, there's a lot of money to be made in these green technology solutions, quote unquote, and that that's not just money to be made by corporations and industry. There's also money to be made by environmental groups. People can make a really good career out of promoting these technologies. And, uh, you know, and that's, that's what we're seeing. So I think those are three reasons why this is, uh, these lies are, are so widespread. And I think we believe them because advertising works, you know, marketing works. That's why they spend hundreds of billions of dollars every year on advertising campaigns and marketing is because it works. It convinces people. Uh, you know, we've all seen the TV ads for electric cars and the family is driving through the forest and they have their windows down and the beautiful autumn trees outside and it's very quiet and 
There's no pollution coming out of the tailpipe. I mean, it's a beautiful vision, but it's a fantasy. It's fiction, right? It's a created story. Uh, but th th that marketing campaign has been incessant for decades now, and it's been very effective. So we need to yeah. push back against those narratives. And our hope is that the book will help do that. Yeah. Thank you so much, Max. Um, well, that's a that's a good segue, right? Which is we're all here because we're excited about the book and we want to know more about it. So I would love if uh, any of you would like to read some excerpts, uh, excuse me, some excerpts you've chosen um, that you think really would be great for people to hear that kind of get this across. And then we'll listen, we'll ha read some excerpts. And then after that, we'll uh, have some questions from people who are uh, in the audience. So I'm going to mute myself now. But um, Derek or Lier, does one of you want to go first? And then um, and then we'll kick it to Max last. No, I was going to go last because mine's the end of the book. No, oh, great then. So uh, Max can go second and Derek can go third. Sure, you're, you're doing a better job of this than I am. Yeah, you, you go Lear first and then I'll, I'll mute myself now, but uh, thanks so much, guys. Forests are being felled to feed Europe's demand for biofuels. There are dozens of huge pulp mills just in the Southeastern United States, exporting 100% of this biomass to Europe. The wetland forests located in the Southern states are right now being, quote, drained, logged, burned, shipped across the Atlantic, and converted to monoculture pine plantations, end quote. Somewhere between 50 and 80% of Southern wetland forests is already gone. Let that settle in before you take on the next horror. The Southern wetland forest area is being logged four times faster than the South American rainforests. The term logged serving as a nice ellipsis of the devastation. The Southern coastal plain is a designated biodiversity hotspot which means there are creatures who live there and nowhere else. Losing these individual creatures' lives is bad enough, but at risks are entire species because they have nowhere else to go. For instance, the Florida yew, a small evergreen tree, is critically endangered because its home is a 15 mile length of the Apalachicola River. That's all they've got. And once it's gone, so are they. Also endangered is the Southeastern American kestrel, the smallest falcon in North America. Their lives depend on red cockaded woodpeckers who are built for hollowing out nest cavities. Raptors are not, so the kestrels need the woodpeckers abandoned nests. This is just one example of the mutual dependence that aggregates everywhere always into life as a whole. It goes without saying that the logging of the Apalachicola River also endangers the red cockaded woodpecker and longleaf pines. Last in this elegiac sample is the gopher tortoise. tortoise. The tortoise digs burrows that are 40 feet long and 10 feet deep. This extra that's extraordinary enough, but there's more. Nearly 400 other species depend on those burrows. 400 other mammals, birds, reptiles, amphibians, and insects cannot survive without the protective cover created by the tortoises who are now critically endangered. These relationships of give and take, need and help, feed and be fed are what create the whole. To scale up a phrase, an insult to one is a permanent injury to all, with insults as catastrophic as an entire biotic community, pelleted, shipped to Europe, and burned. This is the magnitude in time and numbers. This forest has been an ancient refugium since the Pleistocene. The biological diversity is, quote, virtually unparalleled in North America. There are 190 tree species in the Southern Coastal Plain with 27 endemic plants and animals. Beneath the trees, there are quote, 3,417 species of native herbaceous and shrub species and among the highest level of endemism found in North America. And the forest is lush with quote, reptiles, amphibians, butterflies and mammals who exist nowhere else and are barely hanging on. They are our kin our fragile, wondrous, desperate kin. And right now, environmentalists would have them reduced to pellets while calling their slaughter green. Thank you so much for that, Lear. Uh, Max, do you wanna uh, follow that up and then we'll finish up with Derek? Yeah, Lear is always a hard, hard one to follow. <laughs> 
such a beautiful, uh, heart-rending writer. So this is from uh, the chapter on efficiency, page 209 in the book. Here's a question that gets to the heart of the efficiency issue. Which scenario would cause less harm to the planet? All cars traveling 100 miles per gallon of gasoline or all cars traveling one mile per gallon? Mark Jacobson rests comfortably in the more miles per unit of energy club. Mark Jacobson, for those who don't know, is a, uh, one of the heroes of the bright green movement. He's a professor at Stanford, I believe in engineering or civil engineering, something along those lines. And he is the creator of these plans to transition the world to 100% uh, wind, water, and solar. So his plans involve things like, for example, building enough wind turbines in California that they would cover an area four times the size of Yosemite National Park. Um, that's just in one state, in one part of the US. So Mark Jacobson would, of course, agree with the more miles per unit of energy club. Most mainstream environmentalists, bright greens, and indeed most people in general, have by now joined him in this not very exclusive club. A car that gets 100 miles per gallon is more efficient, more cost effective, more advanced. It's clearly so much better for the planet that the question seems absurd. From the perspective of a salmon, however, or an old growth forest, things look much different. A car that gets only one mile per gallon would probably be far less harmful to the planet because low efficiency creates a disincentive for driving and indeed for the existence of cars at all. If you get one mile per gallon and gas costs $3 a gallon, you're paying three bucks a mile. Suddenly walking starts to look a lot more attractive. For example, recently Derek drove five miles each way to eat at a wonderful taqueria, but there's no way he would have paid an extra $30 for the admittedly delicious tacos. If every car got one mile per gallon, why would any of us buy a car in the first place? Why pay thousands of dollars for what essentially amounts to a pricey motorized wheelbarrow? If cars are that inefficient, why build them in the first place? Building highly efficient cars, on the other hand, reduces the cost of driving and lowers barriers to commerce. More cars will be built, and with economies of scale, the costs of each car will fall. This makes the technology accessible to more people, accelerating the cycle of production and consumption. More car sales drive car culture as a whole by creating a greater need for asphalt, roads, parking lots, and so on. Suburban sprawl becomes not only feasible, but inevitable. Politics follows this momentum. Government budgets shift, adding trillions of dollars in road construction to the subsidies for car manufacturers. More land is bulldozed, more factories are built, and more concrete, steel, and plastics produced. Toxins and global warming increase and biodiversity declines. If you value technological escalation, and human mobility for those who can't afford it, then 100 miles per gallon sounds great. If on the other hand, you value the millions of animals, more than a trillion, including insects, killed by cars every year, the mountains destroyed for mineral extraction, the habitat fragmented by roads, or the air polluted by the manufacture, distribution, operation, and disposal of cars, then one mile per gallon, a level of efficiency that disincentivizes car culture itself might seem a better option. Earlier, we cited Richard York, who's a sociologist at the University of Oregon near where I live, saying that for every unit of green energy brought online, only one-tenth as much fossil fuel generated electricity is taken offline. Richard York is co-author of The Ecological Rift, Capitalism's War on the Earth, and the author of articles with titles like, Do Alternative Energy Sources Displace Fossil Fuels? Spoiler, no. 
and Choking on Modernity, A Human Ecology of Air Pollution. Spoiler, yes, we are. In an interview, he told us, quote, efficiency sets in motion certain models of development that can have unintended consequences. Look at whaling, for example. It was the main source of oil for lamps for a long time, but whaling expanded after the rise of petroleum oil, not because there was a demand for whale oil, but because fossil fuels expanded the reach and effectiveness of the whaling fleets. Then the whalers found markets in which to sell their whale oil. Production drove demand. So we go on in this chapter to talk about uh, an example from Las Vegas of uh, there's, there's an absolute limit on water availability in the Las Vegas area. They're draining the Colorado River dry. It no longer reaches the ocean. And they're only allowed to take so much water from the river because of the agreement between the US and Mexico and the different states and how much water is allocated to different users. So because of that, there has been a major drive for higher efficiency in water use in the city of Las Vegas. And if you look at a per capita, per person level, the, the water consumption has declined a lot over the last 20 or 30 years, uh, significantly. Uh, but that efficiency has not been used to provide more water or to steal less water from the planet, to steal less water from the river. Instead, that extra water that was made available that by the efficiency is now allowing new suburban sprawl to spread out into the deserts around Las Vegas. New housing developments, new casinos, new golf courses, new water features in the desert, in the middle of the Mojave Desert. Uh, so, so that chapter on efficiency is all about you know, how these simplistic notions of efficiency always being a positive good for the planet uh, can often obscure major, major issues. Thank you so much, Max. And we have some user submitted questions on just that topic. So I'm excited to explore that more, but why don't we wrap up um, this section at least with, I'd love to have a reading from Derek, uh, he says from the uh, end of the book. So I'm gonna mute myself and Derek, you're up. So thanks, Max, for reading that section because that uh, we wrote the book. I was the primary writer for some of it. Lier was a primary writer for some of it. Max was a primary writer for some of it. And Max was the primary writer for that part, among others. And I remember when I read the first time, the first time I read the draft that he had written of that, when I read that question, which is better for the earth, 100 miles per gallon or one mile per gallon, I immediately thought, of course, 100 miles per gallon. <laughs> and, um, and this is what I love about good writing. And this is what I love about writing in general is, it's one of those, it's a cliche, but one of those paradigm shifting moments for me when I read Max's analysis there, is, is, it wasn't one of those things where it took me 10 years to change my mind. It took me, the 10 minutes it took me to read those couple pages to go, holy crap, he's right. And it completely changed my perspective on efficiency in that moment. So I thought it was great. Um, so before I read mine, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say that this is a very bad thing I'm doing because I'm reading the very end of the book. And if I were a mystery writer, of course, can you imagine if they go in and they- Spoiler. Yeah, I'm gonna read the last page Spoiler. and you're gonna find out it's not the butler, but actually the maitre d'. Um, anyway, uh, and one of the central things of the book is that the book is about facts. We have a lot of facts in the book, but ultimately the book is about values. There's a line in there, we quote Naomi Klein, and we're not picking on her, anybody could have said this. She said that for all the climate marches she's gone to, polar bears still don't do it for her. And polar bears do it for us. And this book is ultimately about values. It's about valuing the planet over this way of life. And so that's, that's where we are. That's sort of the setup for the, for the end of the book. Um, this way of living will not and cannot last. What we do now determines how much of the planet remains later. We can voluntarily reduce the harm caused by this culture now and work to create spaces where nature can regenerate, or we can continue to allow, indeed to subsidize, further destruction of the planet's ecological infrastructure. 
And while that may allow the economy to limp along a few more years, I guarantee that none of us, salmon, right whales, Piscean life in the oceans, humans, are going to like where that takes us. Here's one final image though, to carry us forward through these difficult times. As I write this, and this is literally true, I didn't make this up at all. As I write this, I see across a small space, a small open space in this dense redwood forest, a mother bear lying on her back, head resting comfortably against the base of a tree. The tree, maybe 120 feet tall, is one of many re-sprouted after an old growth redwood was cut here about 100 years ago. On the bear's belly sprawl two cubs suckling eagerly, stopping now and then, as children are wont to do, to squabble until she calms them with a soft sound. These bears, these trees, the flying squirrels who sometimes descend from the trees to check for scraps of food, and the magnificent dance between all of these beings and the thimbleberries, huckleberries, grasses, arthropods, fungi, and unseen bacteria are here for now. And it is for them that I work. It is to them and not to the system destroying them that I give my loyalty. It is to them and for them that I dedicate my life. That is the least I or any of us can do for the planet that, who, <coughs> gave us our own lives. That, who, feeds us, clothes us, sings us awake in the mornings and to sleep at night the planet who welcomes us at our beginnings and to whom we all return at our ends. And as Aldo Leopold, the father of wildlife ecology made clear so many years ago, that is the right and beautiful thing to do. Thank you so much, Derek. Um, uh, so now just uh, as we kind of uh, approach the, the second half of all of this, Max, uh, there's a trailer that uh, for an upcoming documentary um, that uh, Max, if you kind of want to introduce that and get that ready, we can do that. And then I also have a bunch of questions from people who are attending this uh, event um, that wanted me to ask. So I'm happy to read those off at any time. But uh, Max, before I do that, do you want to show the trailer? Yeah, I can also just word. go to a question if you want. Give me one second here. Why don't we go to a question first? Sure. And I'll get this sure. set up. No um, the great thing about doing a Zoom presentation on environmentalism is when you have tech problems, everyone sympathizes with you, right? Um, so, but, um, so I have a question here. It's from Gala, and uh, it's primarily not aimed at any one of you, but uh, Derek or Lear, I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Uh, she says, as dark or deep green environmentalists, we're constantly accused of being negative or pessimistic. And what is your response to that? What do we do when people react to the truths in this book and they say, well, you're just, you know, nothing's ever good enough for you, or you just have too high standards, or you're making the perfect, the enemy, the good. Those are such common responses. And what would you say to someone who kind of described your position as, uh, you know, uh, too negative or too much of a downer? Well, I, yeah, I would say, we're good. Um, I would say it's a good those principles that we, we have two options. We can continue to destroy the planet and find more and more fuel sources to make that happen. And that's the bright green project. Or we can defend the only planet that we know of in the entire universe that supports life. And that is a very stark choice, but that is where history has brought us. We are at that moment. We have very little time left. And I, to me, I don't, I don't see that as negative. I just see that as that's the reality that we are in. And I know where my loyalty lies and it's not to that destruction. It's to all the creatures, that's, that's it, they're my kin. So I don't know, I don't, I, that this is always the problem where people are trying to solve for the wrong variable, where they really want this way of life to continue. And they don't wanna hear the bad news that it can't be done, that you know maybe three generations of people were gonna get to experience this level of consumption. and. It was never a plan with the future. It was always going to hit the end. We have now hit the end. So are we going to grow up and just realize this was all a fantasy? Okay, there was no way this could ever go on. And not, not a single one of these things lasts forever. And we've used up what was here. So we're either going to stand and fight for what we love or I don't know, we can rearrange the deck chairs on the Titanic, but it's not just the Titanic, it's our planet. 
said. You just said it. Well, that's your point. Yeah. <laughs> well, say it now. Is your line? Well, I, I mean, this is this is the stark choice. Now we can fight for the living or go down with the dead. That's that's it. Is, is that um, I never have really understood. I, I get the criticism a lot, but I never have understood it because I actually find it tremendously liberating when someone will tell the truth. And one of my favorite lines is said by a dear doctor friend of mine who says, um, "Proper diagno correct diagnosis is a first step toward proper treatment. And I mean, so many people, if I always think about this, how would environmentalists, if they had the environmental attitude in a hospital, how would it be? They would be going, no, don't say code red. That's too scary. Um, no, don't tell the person they have emphysema. Tell them that uh, you got to put it. Okay, so the bad news is you have emphysema. The good news is that um, you're going to live at least a week. Um, and let's emphasize the positive here. Okay, emphasize the positive. You have emphysema, you don't have rabies. And that's, it's just, the rhetoric in environmentalism is, I mean, I can't tell you how many times I have had editors say to me, so Derek, we want you to write an essay for us about the apocalypse and make sure you end on a happy note. And I don't, I don't really understand it because that's not how I operate when I'm reading a book. Some of my favorite books I've ever read Yes, there are, and I try to put beautiful writing in the books, and I try to put uh, descriptions of the creatures, of the beings I love, um, but I don't, A Language Older Than Words was originally supposed to be this happy book about interspecies communication and how we have, you know, how, how, how there's lots of communication goes on between humans and non-humans and between various species of non-humans all the time. And I was supposed to be this really happy book about that. And then I realized really quickly that to write a book that was really happy about human non-human interactions would be at this point really dishonest because we're killing the planet. And honestly, I write for the salmon and I write for the banana slugs, and I write for all of them. I write for the Delta smelt, and I want for them to say, I'm proud of you, and for them to say, thank you for speaking up and telling the truth. And I also write for the humans who are living 100 years from now. And I think that the humans, presuming there are any living 100 years from now, would, would rather that we told the truth and figured out what the hell we're going to do about the circumstances rather than tell fantasy stories about about I don't know I mean I have been in some situations in my life that are that are that are life and death and I have been in some situations that are really scary and I did not in that moment find it helpful to pretend that the situation was not what it was. And yes, we can talk positive. You know, if you're going into surgery, you know, you do want for the surgeon to tell you, you know, there's a chance there could be this and this. You want to know the bad things, but you also don't want them to say, yeah, you're probably going to wake up in a coma and you won't wake up at all. And I mean, you do want some positive stuff, but at the same time, you don't, you want to know what's what's true and how can we possibly act if we don't know what the circumstance is and 200 species are going extinct today and that's not good and i think i think if coho salmon could write a book right now i think it would be very sad and i think it would be outraged and i think it would be begging pleading and demanding a change and I think in some ways, I mean, here's the thing is yes, that is a concern and lots of people do make that complaint, but I also get so many notes from people saying, 
oh, thank you so much. I thought I was the only person who felt this. I still remember, and then I'll shut up. I still remember this woman who came up to me in 1997 or something. After some talk I did, uh, she came up to me. She was a long time pesticide, anti-pesticides activist in Minnesota and said, sometimes I feel like the only things that keep me going are rage and sorrow. And I've known so many activists who say that. And why don't we give that a voice too? I mean, yes, there is love in my books and there is rage and there is sorrow, but I'm a complex enough being that I can hold in my heart the understanding that things are really bad and life is really good and that, and that it's desperation time and it's time to fight back. And so thanks so much for that, Derek. So Max, now am I good to throw to you for a, a bit of, <clears throat> excuse me, for the trailer? And then I've got uh, a few other questions before we finish up. Yeah, absolutely. So this is a very short trailer to a film that's being uh, finished up right now. Um, a young filmmaker named Julia Barnes out of uh, Canada, who is absolutely fantastic. This is her second documentary film that she's created, um, which for anyone who's done any film production or editing, um, shooting, you know how difficult that is. Uh, she's incredibly talented. And, you know, she reached out to us, um, I'm not sure, maybe four years ago, three or four years ago, wanting to interview us uh, on the topic of Bright Green Lies. And she has created this documentary film uh, with the same title as the book, Bright Green Lies. I believe it's scheduled for release on Earth Day, April 22nd. And uh, he, this is the trailer for it. If folks want to learn more about the film, check out brightgreenlies.com. You can also find info about the book there. Uh, and here is the trailer. Oh, maybe not. Hold on. Jonah, why don't we... Let's see if this works. Can you give me a thumbs up if you can hear the audio when this plays? There is a push for a 100% renewable world. They claim it is good for the environment when actually it is harmful for the environment. It's all become, how do we continue to fuel this destruction? This shit ain't green. So that's the, that's the short trailer for the film. The full trailer is on the website, brightgreenlies.com. I really recommend that people check it out. Um, Julia's incredible. She's very articulate. She understands these issues in detail. And what I think is fascinating about the film is that not only does she interview me and Lier and Derek and uh, people like Richard York, who I quoted from in that book ex excerpt I read earlier, but she also interviews proponents of these bright green laws. She speaks with Mark Jacobson. She speaks with David Suzuki and she challenges them directly to their faces on these issues and seeing their responses, seeing uh, you know, them struggle to grapple with these issues uh, when it really hits home, I think is fascinating and provides some insight into, um, into why these bright green lies are so popular into why they're being propagated uh, so widely in our movement. That's awesome, Max. I'm really excited for that. I hope everyone else is. Um, Lear, did you have something you wanted to say real quick before I kind of go to the giant big question at the very end? Um, yeah, so it's a nice segue because we just saw that little clip from the film, but there was another film that everybody should watch if you haven't seen it, and that's Planet of the Humans. Um, and going back to what Derek was talking about in terms of people's despair and feeling like this is overwhelming and it's also negative. Uh, I mean, I, I didn't know Jeff or Ozzy when I watched that film. I heard about the film and I had seen a tiny little bit of it, a little trailer. And I just thought this is extraordinary. This seems to be the exact subject of our book. Um, and then they, you know, COVID happened. They couldn't release it into the movie theaters and they put it out online for free. So I watched it the first day. And I remember I was standing in my kitchen doing dishes while the film was playing and I, my little computer, and he says this incredible line, you know, he gets to the punchline pretty quickly and he says, will the machines of industrial civilization save us from industrial civilization? And I just started screaming. It was like a, a teenager at a rock concert. I was like, we're not alone. 
somebody else understands what has gone so terribly wrong. And then I just couldn't stop. I just sat and watched the rest of it. I couldn't believe it. And then I immediately went over to Derek. So it was like, oh my, you have to watch this now. We're watching it. I have to watch it again. You're going to watch this. Cancel the afternoon. And it was incredible. And I want to, I want other people to feel that when they read our book, that we are telling the truth and they know the truth. They know there is something wrong, that we are taking the very last wild places and wild, wild beings and turning them into more consumer goods. They've got to know in their hearts because every last one of these projects universally is resisted by the people who live there. We all know that this is not a way forward. So we're hoping to give people a framework and enough facts that, that will back up their native loyalty to the land and, and the creatures. Absolutely, yeah, I second that, a, a wonderful film. Um, so we're, we're nearing the end of this event. So um, I thought I would ask you all to summarize 20 to 30 years of your work in a few short sentences by uh, asking you a question that I got over and over and over again was, if wind energy and solar power and electric cars and all those other green technologies aren't going to save the planet, then what will save the planet? And so, um, you know, I'd love to hear from all three of you uh, kind of about, you know, when, when someone, if someone does read this book and, and they come out saying, well, this obviously is uh, not the way forward, uh, where, where is the next step? Because, you know, uh, it can be deflating to feel like these things that you've been promised your whole life really were just kind of paper tigers. So, you know, what do you do? What would you say to someone if they said, okay, I know that green technology isn't the way but now, now I've got nothing, you know, what, what do we need to replace that with? What do we need to, you know, so much, so many of us are raised with a devotion to green technology, devotion to wind and solar and all these things. What do we need to replace that with once we see that those kind of idols aren't going to do what we've been promised? Any, anyone go, sorry, uh, if, if you want to start Lier and then maybe. I can give it a shot. So. You know, I think the first response to that is that we need to give up on these false solutions before we can actually get down to the real issues. And that's why we wrote this book is because, you know, this, these bright green lies are acting as a barrier to really addressing the problems that we have in the world. These are getting in the way. These are leading everyone astray. These are, uh, you know, causing everyone to waste their energy, their money, their time, uh, their momentum on things that are not going to work, that are only going to make the problems worse. And it, so if we don't address these bright green lies, then we can't even start to think about real solutions. So in the book, you know, we, uh, we, we deconstruct all these bright green lies. And then the, the first argument that we make in terms of, uh, of real solutions is that we need to stop the destruction. We need to stop the war that's being waged on this planet. And that means we have to shut down the fossil fuel industry. We have to shut down the logging industry. We have to shut down the mining industry. We have to shut down industrial agriculture. These things are destroying the planet. They're destroying the foundation of all life on earth. And if we can't accept that and find a way to shut down these industries, then we're headed into an apocalypse. We're in the apocalypse. We're in the six mass extermination event. I don't think it's accurate to call it an extinction event. It's an extermination event in the Earth's history. And, uh, you know, we, we're accelerating into it. You know, carbon emissions are rising year after year. They're not going down, even as the adoption of electric vehicles and solar panels and wind turbines uh, grows larger and larger, more fossil fuels are being burnt, not less. And so we need to stop the destruction. That's the first goal that we have to uh, take on as an environmental movement, as an earth defending movement, as water protectors, as people who are trying to work for a livable future. Uh, you know, and that's not an easy task. That's, that's generational work. You know, that is work that uh, all of us can take on a tiny piece of that and dedicate our entire life to it. And, uh, you know, and that is, that is good work. That is a good use of your life. Um, so, you know, I don't want to underplay that. Like that's something simple that we can just do easily and quickly. And then we can get on to the permaculture and the land restoration and the carbon sequestration and all those things, uh, which Lier can probably speak to more eloquently than I can. 
Uh, because if we don't stop the destruction, then we're just delaying the inevitable. You know, we can do all these projects of, of land restoration and so on, but if we're not addressing the root of the problem, the destruction of the living planet, then, you know, even the best, most beautiful, most lush restored areas, uh, they will have the hammer of global warming fall on them. They will have, uh, you know, the roving eyes of the timber industry and, uh, you know, all those who seek to profit from the last uh, vestiges of the natural world uh, target them. So, uh, Lier, maybe you can speak more to uh, what other solutions look like. Um, well, there's two big things. Um, besides all of this, where we need a new story and we need a new framework and we need a new economic system and all of those kinds of problems, um, a lot of times people feel like, well, it's too late. It's not actually too late because Alan Savory says, we're running out of time. We're not out of time yet. And for me, the biggest hope comes from what grasses can do. Um, grasses can't do it alone, but grasses with their appropriate ruminant cohort can sequester all this carbon. Um, and some of the back of the envelope uh, calculations um, are e extremely optimistic, very hopeful toward this, that if we were to repair even 80% of the grasslands, grasslands around the world that have been trashed by agriculture and could restore them to perennial grasses with those ruminants, um, it would really only take 12 to 15 years to sequester all of the carbon that has been released since the beginning of the industrial age. That's not a very long amount of time, like, it can still be done. And we know how to do it. I mean, there's people all over the world who are already doing this. They're already, you know, restoring the, letting the grasses come home. Um, they know how to set the ruminants on the correct path, like what it takes to move ruminants in a way that is nature's plan. So they're bunched tightly and they're moved quickly. Um, and that restores the local waterways because with perennial roots, it means the water actually has somewhere to go. So there are, for instance, rivers in Zimbabwe that are now 10 miles of running water where before there was just nothing. Like they've extended the river 10 miles from when anybody who's alive has seen it. Um, just simply through that process of letting the rain absorb in through the perennial root structure. And that's what perennials do. That's one of their gifts to the world is they, they collect the water for us. Um, and then all of that habitat re restoration so that whatever other animals, you know, the, and whether it's mammals, birds, ground dwelling birds, migrating birds, you know, whatever creature you love, like they need that home. And all of that lets, lets all of those creatures have a home again. Um, and people can live there. People can, can take nourishment from inside those living communities again. And it's, a, it's not a hard thing. It's not like we have to invent new technology. We just have to let the living creatures who want to come home do that. And we can help them, but they will do it and they can get that carbon out of the air. It's, it really can be done. So that's my one part of hope. And then I always say it's the girls and the grasses because the girls, um, you know, the other thing that's entwined with all of this is the fact that there's too many of us and we are consuming way too much. Um, and people get very nervous to talk about the population issue because of how that has been used historically. We, we know this, that it's very racist and imperialist and you know, the terrible things have happened to women with the one child policy and poor sterilization. And none of those actually help the problem. So put those aside, that is not the world anybody wants and it doesn't even help. So just move it aside. What does help? And this has been studied inside out, backwards and forwards, the number one thing around the world that will drop the population is really simple. And it's teaching a girl to read because when women and girls have even that much more power over their lives, they choose to have fewer children. So as it turns out, when everybody gets what they need, education, food, healthcare, the average couple only chooses to have two children and that's replacement levels. Um, half the children being born right now around the world every single year, half are either unplanned or unwanted. So all we have to do is let women and girls control their futures and their bodies, and this problem will be solved. We can cut the birth rate in half, and then in half, and then in half to something that the planet can actually withstand. And this involves no human rights horrors. It, in fact, involves elevating human rights. So women and girls have to count as human. So we're all gonna have to be feminists. Gosh, what a shame. Um, so those are the solutions, and they're, they're good solutions. There are things that we should be doing anyway, things that we should care about, and they're not hard. Um, 
it's just that every single political institution is faced in the wrong direction. I mean, that's these are political battles that have to be fought, but it's not about chemistry, physics, biology. Like we're not up against any of the laws of the universe to make any of this happen. And if humans got us into this situation, we can get ourselves out of it. And I'll just say one more time, it's not too late. Uh, a few things. Um, one of them is that the solution of empowering girls and women and reducing the birth rate that way only means that we have to take on uh, the Abrahamic religions, patriarchy, and the capitalist slash agriculturalist slash civilization growth imperative. That. Yeah. Um, so, so um, as well as the grasslands, there are also all sorts of other natural communities that want to help. Uh, there are salt marshes, there are mangrove forests, there are forests, there are peat bogs, there are efforts to restore peat bogs in Estonia right now, that it's actually really easy. All you have to do is plug up the ditches that drain them, reintroduce a few plants, and within two years they're sequestering carbon. Um, and they, I guess, peat, peat bogs per acre sequester carbon better than almost any other biome. And I mean, so everybody wants to do the right thing except us. And, and so far as the too late thing, whenever anybody says it's too late, what that always reveals to me is that an incapacity to love, frankly, because if you love those who are being killed, it's not too late so long as there is still one taking breath. And, um, so, I mean, if, if they were, if there was a mass murderer who was, or if there was a serial killer or whatever, slaughtering your family, you wouldn't go, ah, too late. You know, you, you fight until the end. And, and so far as what we do, I always think that the first thing we do and the most important thing we do is we make our loyalty to the natural world. And we make our loyalty to the wild beings the wild places. And once you do that, everything changes because once you make your loyalty not to the economic system and not to this way of life, but to the redwood trees, to the Delta smelt, everything becomes technical. You know, people will say, gosh, how can we save salmon? That's not really what they're asking. What they're really asking is how can we save salmon without removing dams, without stopping industrial logging, without stopping industrial fishing, without stopping the murder of the oceans and without stopping global warming? And the answer is you can't. If you want to stop, if you asked salmon and you listened to what they said, they would tell you all technical solutions, remove dams, stop industrial logging, stop industrial fishing, stop global warming and stop, how do you stop global warming? Well, you stop the actions leading to global warming. That's, that's, it's, none of this is cognitively difficult. And if space aliens were doing to this planet what this culture is doing, I think we would, we would not be asking quite so much, what do we do? I think we would be figuring out technically what we do and we would be doing it. And so again, we need to stop the whole system. And in the meantime, we need to protect all the wild places we can. And we need to help those wild places recover on their own terms for their own purposes. And, and, and we need to once in a while give them a little bit of help, but they will do it mostly on their own because they've been doing it for a lot longer than we have. That's it. Well, thank you so much, everyone. Um, just to recap, you've been hearing here from Derek Jensen, Lear Keith, and Max Wilbert, who are authors of a new book, Bright Green Lies, How the Environmental Movement Lost Its Way and What We Can Do About It. Of course, even with everything they've offered here, it's only scratching the surface of what's actually covered in the book. So I really would encourage you to go out and get a copy yourself. Um, you can find it in local bookshops, of course, but also online at places like bookshop.org or indiebound.org. You can also look up the websites of Max or Lear or Derek and, and, and check it out that way. Um, 
but uh, I so I'm going to wrap up my part of this, which is being the uh, you know the the moderator or whatever. I think I trust you three to handle it well yourselves. So uh, I know that I'm not the one people are here for. It's for you, Max, uh, for Derek, Max, and Lear. So Max, I'm going to let you keep answering some questions and just kind of hanging out with the audience as as long as you'd like to go. But I just like to th say thank you to everyone for letting me organize this, and thank you for. Uh, Monkfish for publishing such an incredible book, and of course, thank you, Max, Derek, and Lear uh, for writing one. So um, I'm going to uh, check out now, but Max, you keep asking questions if you'd like, and thank you everyone for attending, and stick around to hear more from Derek and Lear and Max. Thank you, Jonah. Thanks, Jonah. So we're going to stick around for a little while longer and take some questions because there have been a lot of good questions coming in. We wanted to take the time to go through as many as we can. Hopefully this is helpful to people and interesting. So the next question, which I will read is, a lot of people who correctly identify issues with wind and solar jump onto nuclear energy being the solution. What do you all make of that? Does one of you want to take a stab at that first? We have to switch computers. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I think we got you, Lear. All right. Okay, we Juice. Then he, I know for the whole thing, right? Anyway, we got it to work finally. So you thought he, nobody that. has any idea the panic that was happening at four twenty-five here. Anyway, we got it worked out. So the question is, uh, the question is nuclear. Oh, nuclear! Why do we even have to discuss this? Nuclear is ridiculous. I mean, are we done? I, why are we making garbage we can't throw away? It's millions of years toxic. What? What is even the? Why would anybody suggest this? I don't. I'm, I just. I don't get that at all. So apart from apart from like this way. A nuclear priesthood. A nuclear priesthood. Because for, well, I got that from Jerry Mander. Okay. I didn't make. I'm not that smart, but for thousands of years, you're going to need a group of people who know how to handle things, how to keep that to do with five products and with the uranium and all of that, and this is like. Barrows of years of, of could not have imagined a dynasty that had to last that long. And that's what we're stuck with. And, and we are stuck with it actually, and it's not gonna happen. So it's these are fastest waiting things. And also it has the same problem. It's not but Derek and Lear, we're we're having some audio problems with you. I can hear about one in two words that you're saying. I've unplugged the microphone. Is that much better? Yeah, it sounds a little better for now. Oh, you oh, wait. Is that better? Okay, I can hear you. All right. Let's try that again, Derek. Go ahead. I've got all this complicated stuff. None of it works on my computer. Here we go. Just using so this straight up. Just straight up. Well, I got this from Jerry Mander in his book, um, The Absence of the Sacred. But he talks about how what they've essentially created is a nuclear priesthood. That if you look at the pharaohs of ancient Egypt, you know, where's this dynasty, generation after generation, they could not even have imagined what is required, um, because we're always going to need people who know how to deal with the uranium, know how to get the uranium, know how to keep the equipment running safely, which of course can't really be done, and how you're going to deal with the waste, which are radioactive for a million years, and so it means that there's always going to have to be this this group of people who have that kind of um, education. They're always going to have to be nuclear engineers. It's, we built it into the system, and that's a ridiculous idea. I mean, of course that's not going to happen, but that's what would be required. So it's it's just not doable. I don't I don't even know why people are discussing it. It seems so silly. But you go ahead. Yeah, and when I was trying to make, I wrote. Eric, you're coming through choppy. You might need to turn the computer more if this is that machine when can you hear it now perfect okay 
when I wrote Culture Make Believe, I wrote a chapter about Bhopal and uh, there was a brilliant thing that one of the uh, activists in Bhopal said about it, which was that they'd been making this poison and they didn't have antidotes for it. And the line was, why would you allow someone to make a poison for which there is no antidote? And I don't understand. It's extraordinary to me with global warming, with nuclear energy, with plastics, this culture keeps doing open air experiments with no solution in place beforehand. And that's really stupid. Um, why would you, I mean, I learned this when I was a child that you don't make a mess that you can't clean up. <clears throat> and this is what we're doing with the entire planet. And again, nuclear, plastics, endocrine disruptors, uh, persistent organic pollutants. I mean, all this stuff is just mines. Why would you make a mine that will not recover in anything less than geologic time? It's just, it's just remarkably stupid to me to, uh, to. And another part of the problem with this is that it won't solve. You'll still need fossil fuels because you're, you need fossil fuels to build the plant. You need fossil fuels to run the heavy equipment. You need fossil fuels to run the trucks. It's, it's, this just, this doesn't solve the primary problem. It, something people need to understand is when the bright greens or the nuclear people are talking about any of this, they're talking about electricity. And we hear all the time, oh, Munich is committed to going 100% renewable energy. Los Angeles is committed to running 100% renewable energy. We hear this all the time and it's completely untrue. What they're committing to is 100% quote, renewable end quote, um, electricity. And electricity is about 20% of total energy use. So when they say, oh my gosh, it's, it's so amazing that, uh, that Munich is gonna go to 100% renewable, Actually, they mean 20%. And it's the same with nuclear. Nuclear can't run a semi. So that's 80%. That's where the real action is anyway. So as well as the other problems, there's, a, there's, also, there's also that. And then there's the whole fact that it relies on this entire infrastructure, which needs to be maintained, not only the nuclear priesthood, but also the entire infrastructure of um, mass transportation, of um, mass movement of materials, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Max, did you want to answer that? Yeah, I would just add that, um, you know, we see these prominent uh, climate change activists like George Monbiot, like James Hansen, promoting nuclear energy as a solution. And what that reflects is their fundamental allegiance being to the industrial system being to this way of life, being to maintaining a modern, high energy, highly consumptive, highly wasteful uh, way of life. That's what they wanna maintain. They, they're not interested in maintaining life itself on this planet. They're interested in maintaining industrial civilization. And if that's your goal, then nuclear energy does make sense, just like fossil fuels made sense for so many years. That's why so many of these, uh, these, these fossil fuel companies are now investing in wind and solar energy is because they, they see the writing on the wall. They know that global warming is a threat to their business model, and they know that the culture is shifting to, uh, to prefer wind and solar energy in some ways. So they see uh, a, a new avenue for profit available to them. And they're not going to stop pumping oil and gas. They're just going to add these wind and solar divisions on top of what they're already doing. So, you know, nuclear from the industrial mindset makes sense. From the mindset of life on this planet, it's completely insane. Uh, you know, in the U US alone, there's at least 500,000 tons of uranium 235, that's depleted uranium left over from nuclear reactors, it has a radioactive half-life of four and a half billion years. That's the length of time. Uh, that's, that's, <laughs> that's the half-life. So that doesn't mean that after four and a half billion years, it will be safe. That means after four and a half billion years, 
uh, it may be slightly less deadly than it is now. Uh, you know, and depleted reactor fuel is oddly enough actually more radioactive, a million times more radioactive than when the uranium was raw uranium ore sitting in the soil somewhere in Utah or you know in Arizona inside a mountain where it had been for millions of years. Uh, so these these industries are incredibly destructive, you know. And if people don't know the horrors of the nuclear industry of everything that it does, they need to research. They need to research the uranium mining in the Four Corners region of the Southwest. They need to research Hanford. They need to research uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki and the legacy of that of those bombs. They need to research, uh, you know, Three Mile Island and Chernobyl. Uh, this is one of the most dangerous and destructive industries on the planet. And, uh, you know, it's no sort of solutions. All these people talking about, you know, thorium reactors and nuclear fusion, um, all that is is a fantasy of providing unlimited energy to a culture that's only going to use that energy to fuel more destruction, right? That energy will not be used for good. It will not be used to save the planet, to protect wild species. It won't be used to, uh, you know, make everyone live in some sort of utopia. It will be used to enrich the few at the expense of the many. It will be used to further rape and pillage all across the planet. It will be used to fuel a war machine. And that's what we've seen. And that's what we will continue to see. So it emerges from that same mindset. And I think it will continue that same mindset. Max, maybe you could um, tell people a little bit about what you're doing at Thacker Pass, speaking of mining, <laughs> and why you're there and what it's about. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Uh, for most of the last two months, I've been in Thacker Pass, Nevada, uh, which is the site of a proposed open pit lithium mine. And lithium, as you may know, is the main ingredient in electric car batteries. It's also used in batteries for grid energy storage. Uh, it's used in cell phones, it's used in computers, but the main driver of the increasing demand in lithium, which people are calling an, a new gold rush, a white gold rush, is for electric car batteries. And so lithium mining is exploding all over the world. There are tens of thousands of lithium main, mining claims in uh, Nevada and California alone here in the US. Uh, and it's an extremely destructive industry like hard rock mining uh, and, and mining of all sorts all around the world. We write in Bright Green Lies about lithium mining in Tibet, uh, devastating rivers, killing fish, uh, destroying the, the natural communities that these uh, remote herding and pastoral communities have relied upon for centuries. Uh, we write about the lithium mining taking place in the so-called lithium triangle of South America, Argentina, Bolivia, and Chile. Uh, the lithium mining there is devastating the groundwater. It's taking all the water from these fragile desert ecosystems and the natural communities uh, who live there and the indigenous peoples who depend on those places. And so in Nevada, this proposed lithium mine would destroy almost 6,000 acres of old growth sagebrush steppe. Uh, this is incredibly lush biodiverse habitat uh, the, the sagebrush grows to be over 100 years old. Uh, it's, it's a migratory corridor for pronghorn antelope, our only antelope species on the continent. It's literally some of the best remaining habitat in the world for the greater sage grouse, a prairie bird who has been devastated by uh, this culture, 97 to 99% decline since colonization. Uh, it's, it's the only habitat in the world for a species of snail that lives in uh, who lives in the springs above Thacker Pass. And it's a place that doesn't deserve to be destroyed for the sake of luxury goods, which is what an electric car is. Let's be real about it. Um, we don't need electric cars. We can survive without them. We can get by without them. And, uh, you know, if, if people call themselves environmentalists and yet are willing to blow up mountains, poison water, kill endangered species, uh, you know, destroy wildlife habitat in general, and leave behind a wasteland for the sake of luxury goods, then I think we need to stop calling that person an environmentalist. They're an industrialist at that point. They're a developer, they're a destroyer, uh, and we need to uh, confront the, the people and the movements that are pushing that narrative. 
because it's really more of the same. Uh, the whole environmental movement, I think, has, has largely been co-opted. The mainstream environmental movement has been co-opted by these bright green lies. And, you know, we see that all over, not just in Thacker Pass. You know, further south in Nevada, some friends of mine have been involved in fighting this yellow pine solar project. Let me see if I can actually uh, share a, a photograph with you from earlier today. Um, here we go. So this yellow pine solar project in, um, in Southern Nevada, this is something that we've seen with solar projects throughout the Mojave Desert, uh, Eastern California and Nevada. It's one of the best regions for solar in the country. And because of that, you're having these incredibly beautiful biodiverse habitats bulldozed to make way for square mile after square mile of solar panels. Um, and this is, this is what is happening right now. Um, this is a photograph from a couple days ago. Um, nature is being bulldozed to make way for industrial scale energy generation for powering industrial civilization. We don't need this electricity. We can survive without it. You know, humans need clean water. We need food. We need air. We need habitat, we need community, right? We need shelter. These are our real necessities in life. We don't need industrial amounts of electricity. We don't need these uh, you know, cheap consumer goods that are brought to us by this culture. It's a lie, the whole thing. And so at Thacker Pass, we're trying to make a stand not just to protect that place, but uh, you know, the line that I've been repeating is, this is a fight for the soul of the environmental movement. You know, is the environmental movement really about saving the planet and saving uh, these wild beings like, you know, this oak tree right above me right now, this, this uh, Quercus garyana, the, the white organ white oak, um, you know, is, is our movement about defending our kin, these other beings who we live with on this planet, who by their very life make the world a better place, make oxygen, create soil, create habitat and homes for countless other creatures, create shade for me on a, on a hot summer day, you know, put out acorns who I, which I can eat, which the squirrels can eat, which the deer can eat, uh, which support this entire community of life. Is this what we're about or are we about industrial energy production? And I know which side of that I fall on. It's very clear to me. There's no question about, about where my allegiance lies. So thank you for that. Uh, for that question, Lear, and the opportunity to speak to that. Matt, earlier you mentioned George, earlier you mentioned George Mombio, and this is in the nuclear discussion. And there's a line of his that I've always thought was really important, which is something about, I and mean, this is why he promotes, why he supports nuclear. He says something the effect of how else are we going to get um, how else will we get the energy we need to run our brick factories? And I just want to change a couple of words in that, and it changes everything, which is how will the capitalists get the energy they need to run their brick factories? And once you no longer say our, but say their, you recognize, yes, it's their energy for it's it's they are destroying the desert for their energy. It's not yours and it's not mine. And people will say, well, gosh, you know, you use energy too. But as we made clear, I, I wrote this in Forget Shorter Showers, you know, 15 years ago, that 90% um, of water is used by agriculture and industry. Um, almost all the energy is used by agriculture and industry. And 97% of the waste is produced by agriculture and industry. It's the, the emphasis on the personal is, is a distraction from where the real energy is or where the real action is. We have, we have a few more questions that have been sent in. Probably not gonna have time for them all, but this one is uh, sort of interesting. Um, it's something that the three of us certainly talked about a lot. And uh, Tim James Penton says, 
It's difficult to believe that some of the left's most renowned people seem to believe in the lie that so-called renewables will save us from environmental destruction. What do the authors think might be going on in the minds of these people? Are they trying, are they lying to people or do they believe the lies themselves? I don't know. This is a discussion that three of us have certainly gone round and round about. So for 20 minutes. Yeah. Max, do you want to maybe talk for a minute and what do you think about it? Sure. Yeah. I think that it's a challenging question because you know you look at the work of people like Naomi Klein, people like David Suzuki, people like Bill McKibben, uh, people like George Monbiot, and there's a lot of of good work that they've done. There's a lot of things they've done that I would agree with in terms of, you know, working to protect parts of the natural world, working to push back against, you know, corporate takeover of the world, uh, fighting logging, um, pushing back against globalization. Some really good things. And then on this issue, they seem to have lost, lost the thread. And earlier today, I was having a conversation, uh, doing a training with some people and the topic was biocentrism. And one of the points that we were tossing around in the discussion was the idea that, that, that biocentrism really helps us provide a moral foundation for our work. It helps guide us. It's like a, it's like a compass. Um, and if you don't have that biocentric lens, it becomes very easy, I think, to lose your way in this world that we find ourselves in. And you know, that's like we were just talking about with the nuclear issue. You have these people like James Hansen who appear from the outside to be so brilliant. I mean, I've read some of his work. He's obviously a smart, intelligent person. I mean, he was a NASA scientist for who knows how long, right? He's not an idiot. Uh, but the problem is if your allegiance is primarily to the dominant culture and to the modern way of life, then it's easy to justify these things like nuclear power, which from the perspective, a broader perspective of life on the planet are insane, as we were saying. And so when Naomi Klein, as we write about in the book, when she talks about, you know, polar bears don't do it for me, what she's really saying by that was that she has an anthropocentric lens, primarily, that she's interested first and foremost in the interests and the well-being of, of humans. And if that is your framework, it becomes easy to justify uh, what we see as atrocities. And it becomes very easy to lose track of the moral compromises that you're making. Uh, you know, Linda Hogan is a Chickasaw writer who I often quote, and she says, progress is like a god to people. People justify uh, atrocities in the name of progress. And I think for, you know, I imagine in the mind of somebody like Naomi Klein or Bill McKibben or these other people, uh, you know, and they'll write about just the other day, Bill McKibben wrote a piece in The New Yorker that I read. I submitted a response to it. We'll see if they publish it. Uh, but uh, Bill McKibben wrote this piece and he was basically saying, yes, uh, building out all this wind and solar energy is going to destroy some wild places. But instead of not doing that, his response was, let's pay people in those areas so that they don't fight back against these projects. So they don't work to defend the land around them. That was literally what he said in this article. Let's bribe people so that they don't fight back, uh, which sounds exactly like every fossil fuel corporation, every nuclear industry, uh, you know, all these destructive industries throughout history. That's the great bribe like Lewis Mumford talked about, right? Quite literally in this case. Um, and he's just, he's able to justify that because he, he believes that this is progress, right? And I think he, he's falling into that same trap that we see over and over again. But I'm curious to hear what you two have to say, because as you said, Lear, this is something we bounced around with a lot during the writing of this book. Yeah, and I mean, you can pay off the local people and perhaps some of them will take that money, especially if they're poor and they're desperate. But how are you gonna pay off the Scottish wildcats? There's 35 Scottish wildcats left in the world, 35. And they are all slated for destruction for a wind project in Scotland. 
and they will be gone forever if that project goes through. And this is true everywhere you look. It's the last possible scraps of wildness that are going down. I just, it's just turns my stomach. I don't, I have no idea. But we, I mean, we did, we talked about this a lot over the course of writing this book together because on one hand, they seem like nice people. I don't, I don't know any of them personally, but I don't, I mean, Bill McKibben seems like a nice guy. Like Amy Klein seems really smart. Like they seem okay. And clearly they dedicated their lives to this. You know, like they're really, really, they've done a lot of work and it's not, it's not minor in their lives. I mean, they've taken this on as a project and I, so I, it's like, I don't want to trash them. I don't want to just sit here and say terrible things about and we them. Don't. And we don't, we didn't say anything personal about any of them in the book. It's just, I don't get it though. Like, you know, they, they'll go on national television and say things about, oh, the German miracle. And they got almost a hundred percent of their energy from renewables and it's not true that's the thing you can go and look at the facts yourself and we've got it all in the book we've got a few pages on this exact issue but that's not what happened in germany that it was it was one weekend day so first of all one hour one hour it was on a saturday i think even a sunday anyway there's a lot less use on weekends because a lot of the industry shut down so and windy, bulk, the bulk day. of energy goes into industry. It's not our personal household use. Everybody thinks, oh, if I get solar panels, that'll help. It won't, because that's not where we're using most of the energy. It's not for you to power your lights. It's how people make light bulbs. That's where the energy goes. It's all the stuff that Embodied needs to be energy. powered. Yeah, that's where the energy is being used. So it's a weekend day. There's a lot less energy being drawn from the system, a lot less so first of all, what they're talking about is electricity. So like Derek already said, that's only 20%. So right away, just set aside the 80. They don't even address it. What they mean is electricity. And, 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 and renewable, biomass. Turn, turn that computer there, Derek. Huh. Sorry. And, and most, of the, uh, most of the electricity, the, re the so-called renewable electricity was biomass anyway. So it's cutting down trees and burning them. And it ends up that they're magical, 100% number is like 3%. It's 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 when you when you actually tease it out, A it's really low, B it's completely non uh non uh ordinary what's the word when it's when it's atypical. Atypical, thank you. It's it's atypical. Um and anyway, do you want to go back to the, I've got some stuff to say. Do you want to say more about their about whether they're telling the truth or whether they're... I don't know if they're telling the truth. This is really what I've come to. I don't know. I think that they are in between a rock and a hard place. They haven't gotten to the point where they're going to name industrial civilization as the problem. So they're still solving for the wrong variable because they don't seem, that, they don't seem to understand that there are other options out there. That humans, we've been here 2 million years. It's only this like tiny little chunk of us. That I mean, the industrial Re revolution started, what, 1800? So just over 200 years that's it before that we didn't do this and civilization i mean there lauren cordain is a, a an expert in paleolithic nutrition he uses a um a football field so if you can picture a football field um the entire our time on earth goes all the way to the very last half a yard that's before civilization begins this entire length that humans are on on this planet so that last half a yard is the disaster and the last one fifth of an inch is the industrial revolution so in the scale of things it's just this tiny little drop of time that we've been doing this horrible stuff to the planet and people don't i don't know like what i don't know what they think came before i don't know what they think can come after they just seem stuck in this whole the whole paradigm that it's that this is it this is the only way to live it's the best way to live we're never going to get there if we don't support this way of life and we can't tell people the truth about it so we just need to feel it a different way seems to be where they're stuck but and i don't know how to get people out of it once they're there like to me that all of this seems kind of self-evident i mean i know we did a lot of research and we've backed it all up with facts but it just the basic problem seems obvious at a certain point and they're not there and i don't know whether they ever will be and I don't know. I don't know what to do about it because honestly, they seem like nice people and they're smart people and they're clearly engaged people. And I don't want the left to just be a constant bloodbath either. So I don't know what to do about it, except we wrote our own book. So go ahead. 
Well, a few things. One of them is uh, there's a I love the line by Upton Sinclair. It's hard to make a man understand something when his job depends on him not understanding it. And I would expand that to be it's hard to make people understand something when their entitlement depends on them not understanding it. It's the magnificent bride. That's one part. Another part is that um, unquestioned assumptions are the real authorities of any culture. And I, I fully believe that's true. And if your unquestioned assumptions are that civilization is the only way to live, that's going to guide all of your behavior from then on. And one of the things that really motivated me to do this book was reading people like Lester Brown, Plan B 4.0 to Save Civilization. And, you know, several years ago, and again, I, I, I'm not saying anything bad about Bill McKibben. I think there is no one who has done more, who has worked harder and more tirelessly and selflessly to raise awareness about global warming. He's, I totally give him that. And he wrote to me several years ago and said, um, I heard that you're trashing me behind my back and I would hope that you would have the respect for me that if you are gonna say something behind my back, you say it to me in person. And I thought that was wonderful. That's a, that's a very emotionally healthy and mature thing to do. And I wrote back and said, I don't trash you. Here's what I say behind your back and I'll say it to your face too, which is, you know, you do all this great work and I just wish that you wanted to save the planet instead of saving civilization. But you never say that. You never say you're trying to save the birds. You say you're trying to save civilization. And he he wrote back and and said, you know, he he that he does experience that when he's giving talks, when he says things about saving, even things like fog, that people seem to really respond. But the point is that it 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 he still is explicit in all of his articles that we need to save civilization. And that was one of the things that really pushed us to do this book is you have him, you have uh, the former head of Greenpeace International saying the world doesn't need to be saved. What needs to be saved is this culture. Um, you have, uh, again, Bill McKibben saying explicitly uh, that the reason that we're in such trouble is because we're in denial about the danger that civilization is in. And what we say in the book is, I'll bet that polar bears and walruses wish that sentence would have ended differently. And why are they solving for the wrong variable? I don't know. And here's one more thing is that you said this early on about how it's easier. I'm not in any way saying that McKibben or any of them are doing this to get funding. I want to be very clear. I'm not saying that. But what is true is that funders overdetermine or funders pretty much determine the direction that many environmental organizations will go through that funding. And I've seen this happen to so many grassroots organizations that they'll start off really fierce and fighting to defend wild places. And then they get some funding from some bigger organization. And then pretty soon their funding is dependent upon them weakening their stances. And we can see the difference between, for example, Josh Fox, who has received tremendous institutional support for his work and is supportive of the culture as a whole. Oh, Josh Fox, Gasland, uh, against fracking, et cetera. But the point is that Josh Fox really led the charge to try to make it so Jeff Gibbs' Planet of the Humans and Ozzie Zaner's Planet of the Humans would not reach an audience. They He worked very, very hard and a lot of mainstream environmental organizations worked very hard to try to shut that film down. And my point is that a couple points. One is it's like becoming president of the United States. A sociopath, I, I'm sorry, somebody who's not a sociopath would have a very hard time ending up in that position of power because at every step of the way, they're vetted. And they, the system itself ruins them. And I think the same thing happens on big scale environmentalism that, and again, I'm not talking, there are plenty of grassroots environmentalists and there are even some fairly well-funded environmentalists who still do fantastic work. Um, 
I mean, I just I want to put out a shout out to uh, Chris Tompkins, Doug Tompkins, uh, Yvonne Schoenard, Melinda Schoenard. They do fantastic work. And of, of course, they're also funding themselves for the most part, which I think makes a difference. Um, back to the original point, there's something else. Um, there are some big scale mainstream environmentalists who have literally said, Derek Jensen is insane. And I think that that is part of their, uh, part of the reason that they can promote these ideas that support industrial civilization over the planet is because it is literally considered insane to think that industrial civilization can or should end. And it's literally considered insane to care more about salmon than you do about electricity. I think that's part of the problem too. So it's not that they're stupid and it's not that they're evil. It's just that uh, they consider it to be insane. They have profoundly different value systems. Don't know, that's my, that's my best guess. But I don't understand it because it's honestly, as we've said multiple times, this is not that cognitively challenging. It's not hard, as Lear always says, uh, solar panels are not the fruit of the solar tree. And you know, you don't harvest windmills in the fall. Um, I don't know, I don't know if that answers it all. Do you have another question here? Uh, I just wanna add one thing real quick, Derek, Please. which is, you know, it's the piece that you wrote towards the end of the book about how a false premise underlies this book. Do you want to talk about that for a second? This is the beginning of chapter 15. Yeah. Page 461. Yeah, I think I really, I thought about reading this today because I really like it. Um, we get to conclusion, page 461. A false premise underlies this book. It's that people make choices based on the best available information. That when they're presented with accurate and compelling facts and analyses, these facts and analyses inform not only their personal but collective choices. That is, of course, nonsense. Um, and then we go through that and it's just, I, I honestly think that, um, that, uh, That, that, that our primary use of our intelligence is to rationalize doing the things that we wanted to do anyway. And, you know, John Livingston wrote about this in his book, The Fallacy of Wildlife Conservation. He asked, how is it that some people care about the planet and some people don't? And for him, he said, it's not something you can argue somebody into. It is a state of being. And some people love the planet and some people don't. And if you don't love the planet, then, then I don't know. I don't know. And I don't know. I don't know why I do. And I don't know why you do. I don't know why other people don't. Um, I don't have any idea. If I did, if I did, maybe I would write a book about it. And then it wouldn't make any difference. Because people would still be acting according to their preconceived notions. I mean, that's the thing is our main use of intelligence I and mean, we're so smart, we can figure out ways we collectively, like Germans in World War II, figured out collectively how to commit mass murder in the most industrialized scale. And we in this culture have figured out how to raise hogs and chickens and cows in the most horrible conditions possible and make the most money. And we've figured out how to, you know, I, I know this is off topic, but that's me. Um, I think if you would go back in time 10,000 years and you would say to somebody, okay, which of these things, I'm gonna tell you a bunch of the things that humans are gonna do in the next 10,000 years. You tell me which one you think is not true, which one's the most impossible. And that's, they're gonna walk on the moon. They're gonna be able to talk over great distance instantaneously. They'll be able to fly across the oceans. They'll be able to fly or they will, um, basically kill the oceans. I think they would say, oh, the one that's not true is they won't be able to kill the oceans. That's just nuts. There were so many whales in the Atlantic Ocean that they were a hazard to shipping. So many whales that people were afraid their ships were gonna run into the whales and, and sink. 
there were so many cod in the North Bank that um, that it would literally slow ships down. And all you would have to do is drop a basket into the water and you pull it up and it has fish in it. That's how many fish there were. Those days are gone. Um, I saw somebody sent me maybe 15 years ago a picture of a river in Alaska. And at first it's like, I don't know what the hell this is. Cause I look at it, and it's just a river with a dark bottom. And I look more closely and I realize it's not a river with a dark bottom. The bottom, which you can barely see at the edge is, is yellow sand. What it is, it's a river so full of fish that you literally cannot see the bottom of the river. And that's how this whole, that's how the whole world was. And I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just rambling because we have rationalized ways to one of the smartest things that I ever read that anybody ever told me was Robert J. Lifton said that before you can commit any mass atrocity, you have to have what you, what he called a claim to virtue. And that is, you have to convince yourself and other people that what you're doing is not an atrocity, but instead a positive thing. And I know that's true personally. I mean, I've never been a jerk in my life. Every time I've been a jerk, I've had it fully rationalized. And my point is that, and I'm not saying anything about the people doing it, but all this bright green stuff is just the latest claim to virtue for the destruction of the planet. And Max, I want you to say one thing, which is a fact that you found and put in the book about uh, the greatest threat to habitat over the next 50 years. Do you remember that? Yeah, Please say me, that because that's so important. Let me find the exact quote here. Give me one second. So this was a study in the journal PLOS One that found that solar and wind development threatened to destroy as much land as the expansion of urban sprawl, oil and gas, coal, and mining combined by 2050. I think it's so important that people recognize the scale of this industrial transformation that is being pushed by the bright greens. They themselves talk about, you know, this is a project uh, on a larger scale than the, the previous largest infrastructure project in this country, which was the interstate highway system. Uh, this is a project on a much, much larger scale. Um, you know, as I mentioned earlier in California, uh, wind turbines alone under Mark Jacobson's plan would cover an area four times the size of Yosemite National Park. That's a new industrial development. And also, we did the math, or you did the math on this, where uh, the mining required for Mark Jacobson's plan would require one and a half times the uh, entire iron output for the entire world for a year and equivalent amounts or comparable amounts for copper, all sorts of other metals. It's just extraordinary that what they're wanting to do is, uh, oh, and they want to increase hydro. Mark Jacobs plan would increase hydro by like a hundred times or 10 times or some huge amount. It's just, it's extraordinary what they want to do to the planet. Anyway, I don't know why. I don't know why they don't think this through. You know, part of what it is, part of what it is, is instrumental thinking. And I learned this as an engineer and scientist, is that what instrumental thinking is, is asking yourself, how do I do this thing? And then you figure out how to do this thing. And it doesn't matter whether this thing is building a bridge, building a dam, uh, building an interstate highway system, building a mobile killing unit, building an atomic bomb. It doesn't matter. It's just, how do I do this thing? It's not whether the thing should be done. And engineers are taught, how do I do this thing? They're not taught whether it should be done. Um, I don't know how many people are left, but I just, I'm gonna turn my computer around because there's two giant dogs right now eating fish. It's quiet, but they're so cute. I just love to <laughs> <laughs> Nice. <laughs> the white dog is mine. That's a great dog. What a big dog is. There's a dog named Cookies. 
Derek or Lear, you're cutting out a little bit. Sorry. We don't know what kind of dog Hercules is. We got him from the pound, but what did they tell you that he he was a half German, German shepherd, shepherd and maybe a Saint Bernard Bernard? Mm -hmm. He's a hundred and forty pounds. He's gigantic. So we have more questions, but I don't know how long we want to keep going. We could we could finish off with one more, or if people want to linger. I mean, Derek generally. How many people? I don't even know. Can anybody tell? <laughs> I think there are a hundred people watching the stream right now. I, I, I have to go here uh, after the next question, but maybe we can. Uh, okay, we've got another really good one that we haven't answered yet at all. Um, what can we do as individuals to address global warming and climate change? Um, and my answer to that is I'm going to actually punt to Kathleen Dean Moore because she says, don't be an individual you have to join in with a group that's trying to do something because as just one person, you just don't have that much power. But if you can find a group that's really trying its best and has some power, then you can do something. So don't be an individual, just you have to get involved. That's, so that's one answer. Another answer is find what you love and defend your beloved. Um, if you love frogs, they're under assault. If you love peat bogs, they're under assault. If you love banana slugs, banana slugs here in the rainforest are disappearing. It's breaking my heart. I've seen maybe, I used to see 40 slugs a day easily, 50 slugs a day. Now I'm seeing, I think I've seen seven all winter. Um, and no matter what you love, it's under assault, defend it. Um, and also find what your skills are. There are so many people who say to me, you know, gosh, Derek, you've written all these books. Why don't you organize instead? And I can't even organize my pens or my scratch paper. You know, I, I can't, I, I'm, I have no gift for that. So find what your gifts are and what you love doing. And it's true that if you do what you love, you know, you never work a day in your life. And um, so find what you love, find what your gifts are, find what the largest, most pressing problems that you can help to solve using the gifts that are unique to you and all the universe. Um, you know, we need, we need, I mean, we, we need music, you know, it's, 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 um, <coughs> I like ACDC well enough and I went to see them in concert when I was 19, but it breaks my heart that you can have, you know, thousands of people, tens of thousands of people singing along time on the highway to hell. How about if instead you had a hundred thousand people singing along to, um, to what? shut the highway down or or 100,000 people singing to you know I love the trees and the trees love me there's no better feeling than be loved by a tree or something I don't know um obviously we need somebody besides me writing song lyrics um and and we need people right now you know at Thacker Pass we need people doing things as Lier always says, the big difference is not between those who believe in militant resistance and those who don't. The big difference is those who do something and those who do nothing. And I've told this story before, but I'll say it again. The smartest thing I ever did in my life was when I was about 25. I wasn't doing anything for the planet. I was just, the problem is too big, too overwhelming. I can't do anything, blah, blah, blah. I just, so I got depressed and didn't do anything. And then I realized I wasn't paying enough for gas to cover the ecological and social costs. So every time I would, buy gas for every dollar I spend on gas, I would give a dollar to a local environmental organization because they're starved for money, but I didn't have any money. So I would pay myself five bucks an hour to do activism. And that I could do, you know, how do you stop the whole culture? Can't do it, it's too big. But I can do two hours of activism this week because I spent 10 bucks on gas. And it's the same with how I write books. I don't know how it was for you, Max, or how it is for Lier, but I can't write a book because that's too big and too scary and too intimidating. So what I do is I write a page and then I write a page and then I write a page. And then before you know it, I have this huge long book that's way too long <laughs> and I've got 600 pages. Um, and it's the same with this, that we don't eat this monster all at once. We eat it bite by bite. Do you have an answer for that, Max? I think that's really well said. I don't know that I can add too much more. And that kind of, you know, 
relates to to another question we got from George, who talks about, you know, do you anticipate your new book to have a significant or sufficient impact on the situation? Do you anticipate a significant rise in awareness or readiness to abandon the ship of civilization or even just seriously read a book like Bright Green Lies? And, you know, to be frank, I don't expect our book to solve the problems of the world, uh, not by any means. And, you know, I think that's one of the reasons why all three of us authors have been involved in a wide range of political work, you know, before and after and outside of writing this book. Derek and Lear have written quite a few books, you know, we've all been involved in organizing efforts. And the thing is, these are generational challenges and they're gonna take all kinds of different people contributing in all kinds of different ways. Um, and I, I can't say that any better than Derek did, so I'll just leave it at that. I don't believe that what we, the, the, our book will have to make sufficient change because I don't think anything will make sufficient change not until it's stopped. And um, I always think, I mean, it's just, all I know is that there are certain tipping points that are, that are reached and you don't know when they're gonna be reached. And what you do is you fight like hell to stop. I mean, this is true with a body. You know, if, if somebody is dying in front of you, you know, you do what you can to try to, to, to stop that tipping point where they're no longer alive and their body can no longer recover. And it's the same with this, that we know that there is one dead zone in the ocean that has recovered. One out of the more than 450. And it's in the Black Sea. And the reason it recovered is because the Soviet Union collapsed and it was no longer economically feasible to do agriculture in that region. And that was what, 1990. And it had recovered enough that by I think 2005 or 2010, they were able to have a commercial fishery there, which I'm not too pleased about the commercial fishery, but the point is it went from a dead zone to, to fairly healthy in 15 years. And I am not one of those people who says, oh, the earth's gonna be okay. That really pisses me off when people say, oh, we don't have to do anything because the earth will be fine because passenger pigeons aren't fine. American chestnuts aren't fine. And you can push things past their, push communities past their, past a point of no return. And we don't know when the oceans will get there. We don't know when salmon will get there. I still believe that if, if humans suddenly stop doing all this nonsense tomorrow, I think salmon would be fine. And I think they would recover very, very quickly. Um, I think if you push them for another 15 years, they won't recover. They'll never recover, ever, ever, ever. And so I think, I think, again, what we need to do is just defend every place because you don't know when, when you're going to reach that, that point where it's, it's, I mean, we don't know this when somebody's bleeding out, you know? At what point does the heart stop and you can't start it up again? And it's the same on the larger scale. Do you have something to say? Okay. Well, I think we have a hundred people. I think if Matt seems to go, let's do another you question. Keep going? Okay. Yeah, I'm 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 fine with going a little bit longer as long as there's a, a fair number. Except if you go, how are we gonna how are we gonna run it? Because you're running it. So that's fine if we just quit. I'll make you the co-host, so I think I'll be able to sign off. Well, uh, thank you all for coming. Thanks to everyone who watched. Uh, I hope folks check out the book and enjoy it. And um, thank you, Derek and Lear. Really appreciate it. Oh, thank you, Max. Um, Max, the you 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 did the uh, you did the uh, lion's share, as it were, of the work. <laughs> And I mean, you were, you were, the, the book's core is you. Thanks, Derek. Okay, I'll see y'all soon. Okay, if we disappear, it's because Max screwed up. <laughs> okay, you want another question? Okay, are we still? What's the sound? I have no idea. There's only two participants.
Oh, that's that's Max and and yeah. mine. I don't. That's on this. That that's not the live stream. Oh, okay. Yeah. So we don't actually know. If we're just speaking into the void here. Um, let's oh, see. Cool. I know, right? Like, who the hell knows? Um, well, somebody wanted to know about COVID nineteen and whether the pandemic and lockdown were beneficial to the environment or whether it was the opposite. So. What? Well, what was it? Yeah. There's been a couple times in the past 10 years where emissions have gone down uh, and they both had to do with the contraction of the economy. So what we know is that when the economy increases, uh, so do emissions. And when the economy contracts, so do emissions. And that suggests a pretty straightforward solution to all of this. And They've, they've tried, they being New York Times, um, the UN, uh, other institutions have attempted to make the argument that uh, there have been a couple times where emissions have gone down while uh, economic activity went up, but their claims have been really false and based on outliers. And one claim, for example, was when Germany's uh, emissions went down, although the economy was continuing to do okay. That was, I don't know, fall of winter of 2016 or 15 or somewhere in there. And the reason is because it was the warmest winter on record. And in fact, the the uh, description of this by the governing body that talked about this actually described their abstract as German emissions go down in warmest winter on record. But the New York Times ignored that, the UN ignored that, and Bright Greens ignored that to pretend it was because of um, because there had been a sudden delinking of economic activity and uh, emissions, which went away, of course, the next spring. Um, and so they will grasp at all sorts of straws to attempt to make some other connection. But no, it's really just emissions. Emissions are tied to to uh, economic output. And so when economic output goes down, emissions go down. It's pretty straightforward. Did you want to say anything? That was pretty much what I had. I mean, we have a joke between us that Bernie, Ma Bernie Madoff did more for the planet than all the environmentalists put together because he helped crash the economy and that actually made a difference. So, joke. Um, okay, so. That's true. Well, I know. <laughs> it's only sort of a joke. Um, uh, let's see. Um, I think I actually answered most of these questions. What about, are there any more on, on the phone? Well, there's one, but it's just, it's just kind of, she doesn't understand what's going to need to happen, but she doesn't really ask a question. Um, yeah, it's just kind of like a statement. I mean, maybe you just want to riff on it a little bit. I'll try. Um, let's see. Um, Local solution, um, boycott power, water, compost, renewable, but the billionaires cannot figure out how to make billions. Where are the local initiatives? Eating local is a way to reduce consumption, mass plan decentralization, local self-reliance. Community empowerment will be necessary to prevent the tyranny of the globalists and the feudal lords. So, I well, mean, that's... I, I do have something to say about that, which is... Yeah, make sure that it's, okay. It's, it's, Okay, so so that something that people like to talk about relocalization. I think relocalizing food systems is one of the most important things we can do, and you know that actually does 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 takes me back to the whole to the whole COVID thing. That and I I hate talking about COVID because no matter what I say, people yell at me, and I don't know why. But I'm going to say this that. I started getting really interested in it when, and the point is not COVID here, the point is the shutdown. The within, I think a week or so, what? Within four days of Wuhan being shut down at the beginning of this, a Hyundai factory in Korea shut down because they couldn't get their parts. And that struck me as just, a remarkably stupid way to run an economy where if one city shuts down somewhere, that's going to put 
glitches into the entire economy. And that's one reason, among many others, that we absolutely positively need to relocalize as much as possible, um, especially food systems. And this now to take this back to the bright green stuff, is bright greens like to talk about having non having local solar, et cetera. But the problem is that all of these require the entire global economy because they require rare earth mining, they require steel mining, they require copper mining, they require uh, silicon mining, they require the refining of all these materials, they require the entire industrial transportation system. Just follow the system back and then they require waste disposal systems afterwards and they require a grid because if you have just a local, a, a purely local, oh, we saw what happens with when you attempt to have even a regional economics, a regional electrical system just recently in Texas, that it doesn't work, that the, that the grid really has to be interconnected and that's how it functions. So you can't have a, you can't have a functioning local grid and you can't have solar pho photovoltaics that are made locally because the plants are, the factories are incredibly expensive, et cetera, et cetera. So <clears throat> all of this is absolutely opposed to local economies. There's, I don't know the numbers, but it's, there are not very many uh, large solar PV manufacturers in the world. It's, I, I'm not gonna say a number because I don't know what it is, but it's not, it's not, there's not like 5,000 of them. It's not like farmers where at one point you had, a lot of farmers, even locally. In fact, it is like farmers because everything is concentrated at this point. I think we're out of time, but I could look for more, but I have, I can go into a different view for this. And if we go on Facebook, we can probably find the pictures. Yeah, or I can, if I go to a different view, if I make this small, big. Okay. Sorry, everybody. I have no idea who's even out there at this point. And I've been running around trying to curate the dogs because everybody got hungry. And I don't want there to be a fight. Jamie is still scratching for food. So it's he's he's looking on the computer, looking on Facebook to see if there's more more questions. So if I exit post for screen, wait a minute, I can go to Facebook through here. Facebook, where's Facebook? All right, Facebook. Almost there. Okay. Um, Got to go to the event. Goodness, book launch. Hang on, I'm almost there. Move along, computer. We're still there. Okay. Now there aren't any, I can't see any questions here. We were not prepared. I thought we had so many questions. We were never gonna. You don't. We're gonna get echo. Make that go. Okay. Oh, they want to know what we think about rights of nature. That's a good question to answer. Okay. Shut that down. We can't find them through here. No, I don't. You start talking. How's that? All right. I'll look on there. You start talking. Um. I think. So earlier, somebody said something about whether the perfect being the enemy of the good and how that's a criticism that's sometimes leveled at us. And I don't, I don't, I, I do get that criticism, but I don't, I don't think it's fair. And the reason I don't think it's fair is because I don't criticize things that I think are good approaches going the right direction, but, but ultimately not sufficient by themselves, necessary, but not sufficient, as they say. So I don't, um, the reason I'm opposed to the wind and solar is I think they're actually harmful. And on the other hand, I think rights of nature is a really good attempt to, uh, to protect wild nature and to use the tools of the system to protect wild nature. I think ultimately um, the system itself won't protect wild nature just like uh, Jeff Gibbs said about, can the machines of industrial civilization save us from industrial civilization? Likewise, can the tools of the legal system that's set up to support corporations end up protecting us from corporations? 
And ultimately, I don't think it can. But in the meantime, it can do some things that, that really help. And I don't actually care why the trees end up standing. I don't care if they end up standing because people chain themselves to them or because of rights of nature or because of um, economic collapse. What I care about and what I think the trees care about is whether they're still standing. And so I think rights of nature is a really good approach to um, try to, I mean, here's the thing, is it's completely insane that corporations have rights and for the most part, rivers don't and trees don't. I think that's, that's nuts to make it so corporations, frankly, have more rights than human beings. Um, anyway, so, so I think rights of nature is a, a wonderful direction to go. And I think we need more than that as well. Um, someone wrote, how do you create empathy for the non-human world? I would like to say that all you do is have people walk in nature, but that's not true because I know plenty of loggers who have spent more time in nature than I have. And some of them who know forests better than I do. And does that mean empathy? Sometimes maybe, sometimes not. And um, I'm not sure, John Livingston would argue that we, we don't create empathy. People are born with it or not. I don't know. Um, all I know is that empathy for the natural world, the lack of empathy for the natural world characterizes culture. And here's another thing I know about this. This is why I have fought so hard in all of my books to use the word who for non-humans instead of that. Like the tree who just got cut down instead of the tree that just got cut down. And I've had to fight for this with every single book. And it's something that I do fight for and I will fight for and I won't back down on because they are subjective beings. And so many, so many indigenous people have said to me that the most fundamental difference between Western and indigenous ways of being is even the most open-minded Westerners perceive the world as consisting of resources to be exploited as opposed to other beings to enter into relationship with. And I know for myself that when I first read books by Neil Everenden and John Livingston and some others who, who, who openly talked about the beingness of non-humans, I felt this wonderful homecoming. You know, I, I was um, interviewing Neil Everenden in 1992 and one of the questions I asked him is, so if we don't draw the line between significant humans and non-significant non-humans, where do you draw the line at all? I mean, is it bacteria, is it? And he said, why do you have to draw that line? And that was one of the most important things anybody's ever said to me. It was, I felt this huge rush of homecoming when he said that, that I was liberated in that moment from this perspective I'd had my whole life or this perspective that I had read in every single book everywhere that is non-humans are not subjective. This, I remember, I know we're, we're going way off topic here, but I remember when I was a kid, you know, I was raised a fundamentalist Christian and we, this was one of my big early problems with, with the religion was when they said um, that when you die, you go to heaven. And I remember saying, what about dogs? And they said, no, dogs, non-humans don't have souls and they don't go to heaven. And I remember thinking the seven-year-old equivalent of screw that. Um, I didn't think that because I was seven years old and screw would have been a terrible swear word. But I thought, no, this just doesn't seem right. And anyway, so I think one of the things we do to help create empathy for the non-human world is we just insist on it ourselves and we manifest it ourselves. And we insist on using it in language. And, um, and then that might give other people the courage to insist on it themselves. Do you have anything to say? No, I'm just trying to say the answer was. So if you have a question, you better ask it fast because otherwise we're going to stop. I don't, that's presuming no, that we're I'm even. Saying, um... Okay. It, will, it is being recorded and will be available later. So you can see the dogs again, which is the most interesting part. <laughs> Any other questions? That's all I got. If we were not, if we were like facing them for real, we could go like five, four, three, two, one. You have to ask questions. Otherwise we're quitting. 
Okay, well, no other questions. So you have like, we're gonna go 10 seconds of no questions pop up, we're gonna quit. 10, nine, whoops, eight, seven, six, five, four, three. Okay, well, thank you so much. Thank you for attending. And I hope that you uh, enjoyed it.